entity. Any liability in relation to the statement accrues to the design firm only as a condition of reliance on the statement the building consent authority accepts that the total maximum amount of liability of any kind arising from the statement and all other statements provided to the building consent authority in relation to supporting work, whether in tort or otherwise, is limited to the sum of 200,000. Let's say, look, let's not go into the details of it, but it is uh, it is a tidy up from a legal sense only. So let's very quickly look at the other um, uh, the other ones. Oh, sorry, there is a separate sheet for Schedule 1, as I've mentioned, and uh, Martin will talk more about that, I'm sure. Uh, and look, now we move on to the PS2. Look, uh, and the changes are very much the same, except uh, the bit in the yellow box down here is a there is a bit of a reworking or reordering of what was in there. So basically there is um, uh, it defines the work and uh, the, the limitations uh, as usual, the site verification, those sorts of things. There's a term there that says the scope of our review as outlined in Schedule 1. I guess this is a topic we have talked about before that for peer reviews it is appropriate uh, perhaps to um, limit the review to the, um, if you like, more uh, complex or um, uh, aspects of the project that have higher consequence of failure, rather than putting perhaps the um, resources that we all don't have into uh, mundane uh, aspects of review. So this is uh, this is this ability. This is would again would be in the uh, covered in the schedule one. Um, Say so. so there's the reasonable ground statement, uh, pretty much as usual, uh, and the ref reference to um, uh, the compliance documents pathway. So I say within that yellow box, uh, the same uh, issues uh, matters are covered, but they are covered in a slightly different order now. And again, the bits at the bottom, much the same. Moving on to the PS4, uh, I think we can just uh, skip through that. They are, again, the changes are cosmetic. Uh, along the lines uh, of the PS1 and the PS2. Now, um, finally, I'm just going to sh just show you the updated guidance uh, page, uh, which is um, again important. There's a, there's a minor uh, addition at the top, just referring you to uh, websites where there is more information. Uh, and uh, there's say, some minor minor changes for the PS1, as we've talked about. It's an engineering design professional. For PS2, it's the engineering design review professional. And for the PS4, it's an independent engineering construction monitoring professional. Oops, pick your pardon. Uh, the bottom half of the page, uh, no significant changes. Um, there is a little change here that it says the person uh, signing the producer statement on behalf of the engineering firm will have a professional qualification and proven current competence through the re registration uh, on a national competence based register, such as a chartered professional engineer. That again, that's just a clarification of what we all really expect. So that's uh, look the end of my part, and I will now um, pass over to uh, Martin. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to, Hel uh, to Helen as well for the introduction and uh, her support through for getting these uh, these series out. The excuse me, I'm just trying to. There we are. Uh, so the part that uh, I have that I'll be presenting on is around the the documentation and the quality documentation. So as my in my role as engineering practice manager, I tend to get a lot of queries both from BCAs and from engineers around almost exactly um, half of the the queries that we get here are, are around producer statements. And so we have I have seen uh, producer statements in the past where uh, incorrect has, information has been uh, put into the the wrong boxes. Uh, producer statements haven't been legible and and so on. And so one of the reasons why we are automating the forms is to make sure that all of the correct information goes into the correct boxes to try and reduce the uh, the RFIs to make sure that the uh, producer statements are legible, uh, which is certainly extremely important, and uh, and to make the system flow more easily. So to do that, when we have uh, got the producer statements themselves, and we have backed that up with the with the uh, another qual documentation set that some of you will have seen already, and we are bringing online and automating it. 
as Adam said, we now have the, the producer statements really have three pages to them. So uh, the second page is schedule one, which is where the engineer is expected to uh, to list out the supporting documentation for the producer statement. Now, with the documentation series, this has been evolving over the last couple of years, and the big question about it, of course, is why uh, has it has it taken so long, and why is it uh, or perceived to to engineering New Zealand and to the various BCAs that I've been speaking to about it as being reasonably important. And I've spoken to BCAs throughout the country, and around about. Uh, 48 to 50 percent almost uniformly throughout the country it turns out of the data uh, that, that we've gathered shows that 50 percent of the RFIs are actually generated around the documentation that sits in front of the calculations and drawings. So as I said before you've got the PS ones that have insufficient or, or incorrect information uh, the engineers may not be supplying a construction monitoring report uh, or sorry, a construction monitoring schedule. They may not have supplied a, a certificate of building work or they may have supplied one where it wasn't necessary. So for example, if they were designing a retaining wall that was not part of the primary structure, uh, they may not have put in a, a design features report for more involved work and there may not be uh, maintenance schedules in there. And so why is that, you know, uh, why do these things occur? And so a lot of the smaller consultancies that are out there, and we have to remember that the majority of engineering firms throughout New Zealand, the same as all other types of businesses, the, the majority of engineering firms are smaller firms. And so they don't necessarily have the resources to provide that type of, in, uh, that, that type of information. And one of the problems is that, you know, as we go across the, uh, the, 67 or 68 different BCAs. Unfortunately, you know, one of the things is that we have different uh, requirements all across the country. And so what you're putting in, you know, in one BCA may not be the same type of information that they're looking for in another BCA. And how can we start to standardize that so that you are all getting, uh, you know, a similar standard of documentation uh, that's easy to read, easy to follow, and that engineers can easily access and so and it's all of a similar similar quality. The obvious answer is of course for engineering to New Zealand to be able to provide that for you uh, for you and for them. Uh, the the obvious place for us to put that is because we're putting the producer statements online was to be able to uh, integrate it in and that's one of the advantages of working with Lawhawk as we're doing is that we could uh, integrate the producer statements and then have a flow on so that people will be able to select the different types of documents that they want and so that they can say they do want a design features report, they are going to need a maintenance schedule and so on and so on and so on. Now, uh, if engineers are already providing that information to you, then that's fantastic. And uh, if they're not, then you know it will be easy for them for them to do so and you'll be able to point them towards you know the site where they can do that. And so by the general idea is that by standardizing the information flow that's coming into you, then it will make it easier for your checkers to be able to say, OK, this is the type of information that we've got. Uh, you know, we can find all of this information in known places uh, and r rather than having to search through documents, you know, in a project that I've been involved with recently, we looked at uh, you know, completed documents and completed consents on mostly residential buildings because that is the majority of the, the type of construction work that occurs in New Zealand, uh, throughout New Zealand. And there, there, you know, it was very difficult for, for me to find some of that information uh, as well. So I can only imagine that you struggle with it, um, with it quite a lot at times. So you should be able to easily determine with this information set, you know, things like the corrosion zones, the wind speeds, uh, soil types, maintenance schedule, and so that because it will be all be provided for you in the same place each time. And as I said before, one of the one of the, the big ideas is to be able to set a common standard throughout New Zealand. Now, excuse me, I have lost exactly where I turn the page with the uh,
Thank you, whoever did that. So the next one is uh, the design features report. Um, now the design features report is designed to provide the checker with information around the engineer's assumptions. And Adam specifically said uh, in his documentation that he was going to make it bigger so that everybody could read it. And I wish that I had done the same now. So it's used to provide the checker with information around the engineer's assumptions. It details the basic structure. You know, is it a uh, is it a reinforced masonry building? Is it a lightweight timber frame? Uh, you know, what's the roof made of? Uh, what are the soil conditions? Uh, what are the soil conditions? What is the corrosion category? And with this report, we have made it so that the uh, so that the that the corrosion protection and um, and steel cover and so on is all built in there, and you'll be able to see that yourself with the you know you've got the live loads, barrier loads, soil class, and the metal sheet there, and corrosion protection and so on is all there. It's available for the engineers now, so that they can just click the buttons. They say yes, we are, we do have exposed steel work. We're in this corrosion zone, and uh, and it will automatically come up and it will select corrosion protection according to the uh, three four zero four. Which is quite an advantage. The same, similarly with uh, with concrete, you know, the engineer will be able to uh, say yes, we have, you know, steel against the ground. We have this, and it'll come up and say, okay, well, you've got 25 MPA concrete. Therefore, you need um, this amount of protection, uh, this amount of cover, and so all of that information should be right there uh, available to you. Once again, in the same place each time, so that you can easily check it. Uh, if you can click on to the next one now, Adam, that'd be great. Thank you. Now, with the certificate of design uh, and the letter in lieu, so we developed our own form around the certificate of design work and uh, you know the memorandum for the licensed building practitioner. The reason that we did that was we received feedback from Auckland Council that there have been instances of fraud where people had been using the MB form, inserting in different information underneath an engineer's signature. And so we thought, OK, how can we make that more fraud resistant? Uh, so we shortened it down. Our legal team uh, spent a fair amount of time going over this to make sure that it all complied with the with the MB documentation and came up with this two page form instead, which contains all of the same information that is required from, from an engineer, but is easier to read and, uh, and, and sets it all out. Once again, this is an automated form now, and so all the information will flow through from the design feature, uh, from the producer statement to the design features report, certificate of design, so that the engineer is only entering the information once. And hopefully what that will mean is that there is less likelihood of Errors being made so that you're generating RFIs, which are, you know where they may have put an address on one, but it's you know copied and pasted from another uh, from another job or whatever else it may be, and their and their job files. And th this will reduce that, and so you're not having to produce uh, RFIs that are because of uh, clerical errors, essentially. Uh, with the letter in lieu design, I'm pretty sure that all of you will be familiar with that now. Uh, once again, it's it's an automated form, and so it will uh, be able to come through. It's the letter of lieu uh, of a PS1 around durability, and goes through and specifically states what the engineer is uh, is is using in that particular job. Thank you, Adam. Now the maintenance and monitoring schedule with the exposed steel work, as you know, at the moment we with exposed steel work, we struggle with the corrosion protection to uh, put in a, uh, a 50 year um, design unless we are oversizing the steel. Now the the maintenance schedule was uh, or the you know the, the the majority of it was kindly supplied by Adam and, and his firm to to come around this this issue, and so that the engineer can be supplying a, a maintenance schedule with it. Now, it is a template, and the template is uh, once again adaptable, so that 
the majority of you know residential buildings, for example, don't have a plant room, and so the engineer should be adapting that maintenance schedule for each individual job. If you're getting one and it says inspect the plant room every ten years, for example, on a uh, on a lightweight timber frame house, then it's um it's it's yeah it's it's probably not not what we're looking for. And then after that, we're getting the construction monitoring schedule. Now, the construction monitoring schedule should be supplied with virtually every job that an engineer provides to a BCA. And the reason being that when we design things, we uh, should be inspecting them to make sure that they are uh, that they have been you know constructed in, in accordance with our designs. And of course, with the with the building consent. Now, the only way that we can we can do that is to make sure that the builder and the building inspector uh, from the from the BCA, BCA understands when we're going to be coming out and doing that and what we're going to be inspecting. Now, there are things that an engineer uh, needs to inspect, and there are things that you know building consent officer is is more than competent to be inspecting. But we need to be detailing out who's going to be inspecting what and when. And so if the uh, if the engineer is saying that, for example, they've got a, uh, let, let's say, a, a single timber lintel that they have designed with a point load on it, and they're saying, look, the building consent officer should be able to inspect that as they're going out and doing the rest of their inspections, here are the drawings, uh, then they need to be stating that in there. And the building consent officer should be able to go in and say, okay, Here's the hold downs, understand how that works, understand how that, that, that works. That's great, thank you very much. Similarly with jib bracing. Uh, I think I've been out and inspected jib bracing maybe once, the screwing patterns. The BCO is inspected all the time. They're, I expect more, far more competent to inspect it than I am. With steel work and, uh, and you know, the likes of board piles and so on, uh, then you know, the engineer should be going out and inspecting that. So, they need to be telling the builder when they're going to be inspecting it, and they need to be telling the BCO that they're going to be going out and inspecting it and when as well. With the new form that we have here, then the uh, it clearly states on there what's going to be inspected, when it's going to be inspected, or at what part of it, and who is going to be inspecting it. So whether that's the engineer and the BCO. So when it's coming through and you are seeing that in your consent application, then you can, uh, then you can say, okay, yep, no, we'll, we're happy to go out and inspect the timber lintels, and we're happy to go out and inspect the the hold downs for the uh, for the bracing walls. But you know, we're not going to go and inspect that steel portal frame, for example, because that's not that's not what we do. We expect the engineer to be going out and inspecting that. So that lets you have an upfront conversation with the with the engineer uh, beforehand. And once again. It should be starting to set so that the the builder will know where to to look for the construction monitoring and schedule, and that they should understand that there should be one there each time, and the BCO should uh, or the the BCA should understand that there will be a construction monitoring schedule coming from the engineer as well. So that's that's um th yeah that's that's uh that's all about that one really. The last part, so uh, so yeah, realistically, that's that's pretty well it. This has gone faster than it did when I was practicing it, probably because I get nervous when I'm presenting to a couple of hundred different people. And so the next step, step for us, at the moment, this is all set up for structural engineers or primarily for structural engineers. And so I intend to be adapting this for geotechnical and fire engineers. There's a couple of things in there that uh, we want to be looking at around the. Uh, so when engineers are specifically doing wind speed, for example, you know, do we need or would you suggest that, you know, we could be adapting various parts of the documentation for that? And I'll be looking to integrate it so that, you know, what parts of uh, this are relevant for geotechnical engineers and what do they need? They will need different flows of doc, uh, documents to you know they're, they're less likely to be doing um, wind speeds, for example, and uh, similarly with fire engineers as well. We've got it set up so that 
I have got budget and therefore continuous improvement of the of the documentation system. And so I'm relying on uh, BCAs as well as engineers to be telling me what's working and what's what's not. So uh, I believe that you've all got my uh, contact details. Uh, if not, then you know I will make sure that they get sent out with this uh, with this webinar and please contact me. Uh, let me know what's going on. Please fill in, uh, let us know through the surveys and so on what you think is going, going to be a good idea. We'll be sending out the PDFs uh, as well as the uh, as well as this presentation. And the next thing that we've got coming up is the construction monitoring guidelines. Now these have this is once again a project that I'm working on with Ace New Zealand and Helen. It's been a while since these were updated and they were primarily for vertical infrastructure. We're making working on making them uh, more compatible with the horizontal infrastructure as well and making it clearer so that you as a BCA can say, OK, yep, you know, th th there will be less discussions about what type of project should be, you know, CM3, for example, because it's pretty well laid out exactly what should be a CM3 project inside there. Uh, or CM4, CM5, CM2, what does CM1 mean? Um, because once again, it's a large part of conversations that I get uh, pulled into is what is this a CM3 project and really what do, what exactly does that mean? And from there, we're, we're actually a little bit early, as I said. Probably hand it over for any questions. Thanks, Martin. Um, and there are definitely a lot of questions that have come through, so I'm going to try and do justice to them all. Um, and um, some of these will require you to, Adam, if, um, if you're able to answer. And I think I'll, I'll direct the first one to you, Adam. So we've got a couple of questions around liability. So um, the question is, should the max liability of 200k on producer statements be increased for large multi-million dollar projects? And it also relates to a question around Hub City Council insisting on 500k and whether we need to update from 200k. Uh, thanks, Helen. Yeah, look, um, those are good questions. I guess I might have expected those. Um, certainly, uh, I guess what we say in terms of um, bigger projects is that um, the bigger liability relationship for the consultant is with his uh, with the client and. Um, they, you know, on a large uh, commercial multi-story project, the the level of an, uh, of liability will be uh, many times what um, is shown on the producer statement. That's a different relationship. It is a relationship between, uh, if you like, the designer or or the or the design reviewer, uh, construction monitor, uh, with with the BCA, and it's really, um, I mean, what we've always the way we've discussed it is. To signal to the um, uh, the BCA that um, you know the, the the firm engineering firm they are dealing with uh, are, are not men of straw or women of straw for that matter uh, that they um, you know that they uh, have the the processes and systems in place. Now, what I think to just reflect upon there is that uh, the legal opinion is that the liability that a consultant offers to his client is additive. With the liability that is uh, that is provided through the producer statement. So if you uh, make those unreasonably large, then the process uh, will break down, um, and that's because of you know the dire state that you have to say that the insurance industry is in across the world. You know, with the disasters, climate change, all those things, you've got to say that the availability of insurance is is limited in itself. So if there are concerns about larger um, projects and uh, potential liabilities arising from then I would suggest that the appropriate response is uh, to do uh, more QA if you like, uh, more in depth peer reviews or uh, and checking uh, through third parties. Th that sort of process is the way uh, to address um, uh, you know, larger potential liabilities and concerns. Thank you, Adam. And, the, and there's a related question here, which is, um, what, who decides the value of the PI insurance for any projects? And you've talked about the aspects that there are different way to manage risk and having conversations about quality is another way. Who, where does the responsibility for those conversations sit? Um, well, I guess 
as I say, the the it perhaps comes back partly to my response to the previous question that the um, you know clients uh, the, the the client uh, design firm relationship is is a key one, and um, really that 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 sets um, uh, a, a benchmark for for that for that relationship. Now, I mean, I can. Um, Tell you that you know, we we would typically on a you know, hundred million dollar project we might be have an insurance uh, liability uh, in the in the order of something between uh, three and five million with with a client. So that's that's a lot, lot larger. There is there is a practicality of how big it can be. Um, some of the larger firms, really large firms, may be able to offer um, liabilities up to. Um, you know, larger than 10 million, for example, but you'd have to say they will be very reluctant to, to give it and the availability uh, of the, of that is uh, is de decreasing. I can tell you that us as a small to medium firm, uh, we we now struggle to get larger uh, indemnity covers from uh, from our insurers. And so if you push those limits up too high, then there is a danger that smaller practitioners will not be able to practice. So it is, uh, it's um, look at any time uh, the industry through Helen uh, and uh, others are related. Uh, you know, we'll welcome discussions on this matter. But it is it is a matter of uh, not trying to, uh, if you like, um, transfer liability unreasonably, uh, and to to work within the, the processes and systems that are available to us all. Mm. Thank you, Adam. There are a lot of questions around um, the liability coming through, so it's certainly a, a topic of interest. Um, but we'll move on and look at some of the other questions now. Um, perhaps one for, I don't know, one for one for Martin or one for Adam. You can jump in whoever you think is best. But the question is, site verification is one of the items to be filled in in the PS1. If the ground conditions are outside the scope, how does the PS1 author ensure the correct geo report or correct site finding are captured? Um, well, I can have a go. I, I think, um, look, there has to be some reliance uh, both on, I guess, uh, the, the designer uh, and the um, and the contractor. So for smaller for smaller jobs, uh, you know, quite often it is, uh, you know, effectively, uh, you know, for, for small domestic founda foundations, uh, piles and, and pad foundations, um, the there is perhaps uh, SPT you know, penetrometer tests to be carried out either by the designer or by by some builders will do that. Um, but I guess that there is certainly what we saw in Christchurch and the red zone residential areas issues like that. So that um, hopefully the engineering uh, community, not only the geotechnical but also the structural community, is aware of where there are problem areas. Uh, you know, areas where there has been you know, cut and fill, they are a red flag to us all. Uh, and so uh, I guess BCAs should also be playing their part in that. They are aware of um, prob problematic areas within their jurisdiction, uh, you know, be it you know, soft ground, uh, grounds uh, potential for liquefaction, uh, areas of over peat, all those sorts of things. I guess there's, there's quite wide knowledge. So uh, it's it's for smaller jobs, I guess it's it's harder, as as Martin said. You know, an engineer may be engaged just to do some very simple aspects, uh, and you know, for for very uh, simplistic type residential, the design work may be done more by um, you know designers, architectural designers, and so um, you know, without, without the involvement of of an engineer. So, um, as I say, look, I think the thing is, as I guess I'm repeating myself now, but it is. A, a, for everybody involved in the process to be aware that it is an issue, uh, and to and for, to highlight where greater work, greater investigation is done. On larger commercial projects, of course, I guess it's standard to to, to say these days that you know, structural engineer, um, we we will inevitably uh, involve a specialist geotechnical engineer, and, and we would also do that on res uh, speaking from my own experience. We would also do that on residential sites if we are aware that the ground is uh, you know, beyond our uh, local uh, knowledge or expertise. Thank you. Yes, just to add into that, uh, there have been so in the 
presentation that I gave, I used an example of if the engineer is only doing a, a single beam, for example. And at that point, it's unlikely that the engineer would have been engaged to do any soils testing or provide a soils report. If the engineer is doing, th this is a uh, this is a, something that's been coming more and more to the forefront at the moment. And so if the engineer is doing, you know, the foundations, for example, as well as bracing or, or whatever else it may be, it's reasonable for them to uh, to state their assumptions and to if they are going to be uh, setting the assumptions that it is either 3604 ground or that they are doing specifically designed foundations uh, around that that are within the scope of their competency, then what are they basing that those assumptions upon? And so, you know, uh, providing the results of an NZS 3604 test or uh, you know, as Adam was saying, you know, the, the scalar and or potentially SBT uh, tests that are available. Now we are actually working or a, a project that I started working on within the last couple of weeks is what does good look like um, amongst that? Because that is something that has been uh, th that we've struck and, and that is a bit of an issue. And so it's probably not going to happen quickly because I've discovered that these projects very rarely do. But uh, but it is something that we want to get out so that engineers will know what good looks like once again, and so does uh, and so do BCAs. Exactly as Adam was saying, there are residential sites where you know you would you would certainly expect a geotechnical engineer to be involved, and definitely with you know commercial and industrial projects. But there are uh, you know large amounts of uh, soils investigation where a structural engineer can do it. But you know what does it look like? for uh, those reasonable grounds to be satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Martin. Um, a couple of questions have come through about construction um, monitoring and um, consistency and giving detail to that. Now, those came through before um, Martin, I understand, went through his section talking about the construction monitoring schedule and um, the intention to review the construction monitoring guidelines. So I will... Um, I'll just acknowledge those ones and acknowledge that there's some work going on in those spaces. I'll, I, I'll Sorry, button there. Sorry, I, I will answer that one, Helen. Um, okay. So I was up talking to a, a BCA in New Plymouth a couple of weeks ago, and I said we have all of these examples on the Engineering New Zealand website um, of what a good construction monitoring report looks like for, you know, certainly around residential work. Uh, what I realized afterwards was that they're in the members only area and uh, so that BCAs can't access them, which was a, a mistake on my part when we produced them. And so what I'm going to be doing is getting a, a page that BCAs can access so that you can see uh, examples of construction monitoring reports for you know the likes of residential and so on and say this is what good looks like uh, in those. And that should work in quite nicely with the construction monitoring schedule. Yeah, look, I, I might have a quite a quick button too. I think look, it's probably fair to say the days are gone where BCA should accept a PS4 uh, just without any uh, accompanying uh, documentation. You know, actual uh, the actual site monitoring reports, site reports, whatever the, the whatever the practitioner calls them. Um, it, it is. I know for our, for our own firm now, when we issue a PS4, there will you will get voluminous amount of information uh, that has come from our own site visits, from uh, information from the builder and from his uh, and from the sub trades as well. I, I think it's, it's really important that um, the BCA should expect that information and and demand it. Uh, I I as I as I um, drift into retirement, I'm starting to do a bit more expert evidence type process. And I have to say it's quite common to see uh, on property files, the PS4, just one page with nothing attached. Uh, and I say that uh, that situation, in my view, certainly um, should change. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that in there. Thank you, thank you. Um, OK, so um, we've got a question now about um, B2, Martin, so I'll direct this to you to start with. So um, the question is, please address how building code compliance B2 clause will be addressed in the PS1, PS2 and PS4. Is the current practice of issuing a standard statement the right procedure? Um, isn't the engineer responsible to ensure the required coatings re are reviewed to check compliance? 
In some cases, it was left to others to decide. Uh, well, actually, Adam was the primary author of the B2 oh, well. uh, guidance that we that we put out there, and so I did give a presentation on it in the CSOC conference. But I think that Adam is more than qualified uh, to answer this one. Look, the, the short answer is, I think uh, certainly far as we're concerned, and I'm sure Martin would agree with this, is that it's it's status quo. Um, th there is there's quite a good document I think that's available on. Um, the Engineering New Zealand website, which which you know, discusses the um, the reason why we use the in lieu letters or whatever you want to refer to them as for for uh, uh, PS one, two, and four for B two, uh, and and those um, the you know, the validation of the reasons uh, within that report I don't think have significantly changed. Sure, we are getting some. Um, Clarification on some of the steel coating uh, procedures, some design guidance from uh, standards and and uh, uh, the, the steel organisations. Um, but the underlying reasons why it's um, while it, we firmly believe it's not appropriate to issue B2 under with producer statements uh, haven't changed. And uh, once again, the the durability guidance that we put out is within the. Engineering New Zealand and ACE New Zealand members only area, uh, but I will make those available. Uh, actually, I'll send them out to everybody that's on this list so that uh, you'll have those. You'll be able to uh, read it and and keep it for yourselves uh, for the BCAs. Thank you. OK, next question is, should the review engineer tick, so the review engineer tick all instead of part only in their PS2? Otherwise, council has to go through the design to determine which parts are not covered by the PS2. Uh, perhaps I could dive in there. In fact, that's one of the changes is that the PS2 no longer has the part or all. Um, but as I suggested, uh, well, as I talked about uh, for, a, for a PS2, it, it is sometimes appropriate to limit the extent of the review. And that's something for the schedule one page uh, for the PS2 uh, to, needs to be explicit about. So I can tell you the way that we work uh, with, with Wellington City here uh, on, on larger projects. And, and so we, uh, when we do more significant uh, complex structural works, we tend to go and have a pre-app. We discuss with the uh, building officers uh, the, the areas of complexity, the areas um, of high consequence of failure, those types of things, and we usually mutually agree what are the areas that require a peer review, uh, and that's documented through the pre-app process and uh, written into a brief. That brief is then given to the peer reviewer, and then um, we would expect the peer reviewer. In fact, they they almost inevitably do reflect that brief in uh, in their uh, peer review report. Now, look, these are these are larger projects, commercial projects. As I say, I think it, it um, for, for when when we look at the state of our industry and and uh, you know the boom we're going through in terms of demand uh, and the limitations of resources, not only materials but also of people and experts, uh, to say that you know every project should have every aspect of the design um, uh, peer reviewed is a dumbing down of the process and the using using of, of valuable resources. So we need to be targeted. So I very much say that we you should be able to limit um, the uh, the extent of the review. But I guess you're saying if you're not limiting the review, then you are the review effectively does should cover uh, everything that has uh, been designed or that is covered by the PS1 issued by the design firm. Uh, so then the design review firm needs to cover the full extent. Uh, just just correct me if I if you don't agree with any of that, Martin, if you would. No, uh, I agree completely. Thank you, that was very clear. OK, next question. Sometimes we see engineers signing producer statements on behalf of multiple companies. This may indicate a clash with their PI insurance policy as PI terms generally require the CPENG to be a full time staff of the design firm. Will the new producer statement procedure be able to deal with this problem? Um, well, um, Martin's not not diving in there, so I have a good Quick few words. I mean, look, only to say that, look, um, I think we would all look with uh, some uh, disparagement upon that practice. 
Uh, I have to say that I have seen it myself um, and it tends to be in uh, practices giving bespoke uh, uh, producer statements, if you like, bespoke advice relating to uh, maybe seismic restraint or uh, specific areas of uh, proprietary design. Uh, and I, look, I'm not quite sure why it happens. I think the desirable situation is that those engineers should always be issuing on their own letterhead, if you like, on their own firm. Their firm should be, uh, r rather than doing it uh, on behalf of, if you like, a, a manufacturing type uh, firm. So, because that's, that's the process as I understand it, is that sometimes if people are hired almost as an in-house engineer, um, to do some work uh, for a, you know, perhaps somebody who's doing a, a balustrade, for example, then um, they will issue the uh, producer statement on behalf of that manufacturing firm, uh, but with their name. I th it does give confusion to the to the industry in the process. So my own view is that BCA should, um, if possible, um, request that they come directly from a, a recognised. Uh, professional services uh, engineering firm. I don't know if you have a view on that, Martin. Uh, I, I haven't actually seen the process and I could own that process by anyone else and I could only relate back to the firm that I used to work for. Uh, we and, and what we used to do was we would only cover our own design and if there were specific elements, as you say, with seismic bracing or you know, perhaps um, balustrades that were done by an, another firm, then uh, then we would state that those components were being covered by their by their producer statement. And I would have thought that that was industry practice. And so it surprises me that, uh, well, that first of all, I haven't heard of it before uh, and that it does occur. Thank you. Um, so we've got um, a comment here around um, liquefaction. And um, I've just I've just lost it. Um, how will engineers cover liquefaction where required due to upcoming changes? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the question is. It's mm. I would have thought that it was a, a ground condition, you know. And are they asking whether uh, you know it's being taken as part of the design? Do you, what do you think, Adam? Um, I, I well, well, like like you, I'm, I'm a little unsure of the question. I think it may relate to the, um, uh, you know, the post seismic, um, you know, work in Christchurch, where there are, uh, there's been obviously following all the local action um, in the in the residential areas, which led to the red zoning there. Um, there's been a lot more attention paid to um, uh, new housing there and there has been I guess recognition that uh, in some ground so some types of ground that there is um, in a very large event uh, you might get some uh, seismicity that uh, you know within the within the um, if you're usual and expected uh, or, or typical foundation types that you may get some um, uh, some uh, settlement or displacement occurring. And there have been some various structural slabs uh, systems introduced, for example, that enable uh, slabs to be foundations to be re-leveled uh, following uh, displacement arising from liquefaction. Um, and look, look, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I know that the, the BCAs down there and, and local practitioners have struggled a bit with it. And, and so uh, I guess is an area that perhaps needs a bit more clarification as to what 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 the PS1 or uh, 2 actually means that, uh, in relation to that. And uh, I, th I think, look, normally in those areas, a geotechnical engineer is involved as well. So I guess it's, uh, Martin, I may not be the, just the quite the correct people to respond to that question. Yeah, on the, uh, the design features report that we have in there, it does uh, specifically say, you know, which levels of liquefaction uh, risk there are. Uh, assumed to be on that site and you know certainly are encouraged the BCA to be looking at those levels of risk and whether the person that's signing it off uh, is you know 
uh, competent to do so. And so, you know, if it was anything above, uh, I would think, a relatively low level of risk, then it would probably be required for a specifically designed foundation. Uh, what would your thoughts on that one be, Adam? Uh, no, no, I agree. Yep. OK, great. There's quite a few questions here. Um, we'll just do a, a couple more, I think, before we'll wrap up. Um, so if we haven't got to your question, don't worry, we will find a way to, to feed back to you. And I also note that there are a few just comments in here for, for our um, consideration and they're very useful too, so thank you. Um, the next question, there's a, been a couple of questions around um, engineers assuming soil conditions as per um, NZS 3604. Um, so one question is around it being used without justification, um, which has created an issue at CCC stage to satisfy the observation requirement to verify and submit the PS4. Um, so these the, the questions um, convalesce around the issue of who's responsible for, um, for verifying um, in terms of 36, um, 3604. I'll jump in on this one. And so this this kind of relates back to the con uh, to the answer that I gave before, uh, where as, as we stated that, if, for example, an architect is uh, is designing a house and they are doing you know everything to 3604, then I would expect that they would be uh, submitting some sort of justification for uh, for for those assumptions. And the engineer was only, uh, you know, expected to do a very simple uh, timber beam or something and nothing to do with foundation design. With the other projects, then yes, I uh, completely agree. If an engineer is assuming 3604 ground uh, and stating that in, in their assumptions, then they should state the reasons why they, uh, they are making that. And it could be that, you know, uh, that it's a, a subdivision site and that they have a geotechnical report that says that the ground has been you know prepared to 3604 uh in which case great you know uh please reference that report otherwise please show the results of your of your testing yeah look i i would I, I agree with that and, and as i say we talked about this in one of the to one of the responses to one of the previous questions to a, uh, to a certain extent um uh certainly if there's no engineer involved or if the engineer is only has a small involvement then uh, that can be a you know uh, a ready response uh, at uh, consent time. You know this ground is to be um, you know found on good ground in, in accordance with 3604. Uh, ideally, you'd have to say say, and as I'm kind of repeating what I said earlier, but there's there's two things that can occur. One is that hopefully that the BCAs would have local knowledge of where there are problem areas, and so if it if the if the uh, dwelling or property is in one of those areas, then that should a flag should be raised and more information should be sought. The other aspect is that from on the part of the engineer and, and probably on part of the architect, there is an assumption that the builder um, should be competent if there's a licensed building practitioner to do um, whatever tests are appropriate to confirm that it, that it is um, good ground or good enough ground, and if not, to raise a flag. You know, and, and that is, uh, you know, there are tests caught up within 3604 for the builder to do. So, um, but but I think, look, people are raised, uh, ready to, uh, are correct to raise this as a problem area or potentially problem area. Uh, and if there is uh, doubt during the uh, consent process, then again, a flag should be raised and the uh, uh, query should be raised with the, uh, if you like, to the architect or to the engineer if there's one involved. Thank you, Adam. OK, just a couple um, of more questions. Um, there are some questions around um, who should be signing producer statements. So one relating to, um, you know, can we sign producer statements to regions that don't require one, even if we're not an engineer? And also um, in relation to Auckland's um, producer statement um, register. So maybe, Adam, you could just clarify for us who should be using and signing these documents? Um, yeah, well, look, Martin and, and I might give you slightly different uh, responses to this. My response is that, uh, you know, in terms of these um, documents, we're talking about the PS1, PS2, PS4, um, they are aimed for signing by a uh, chartered professional engineer. Uh, and when we look to where the government is, uh, is planning to take us in terms of uh, occupational licensing, uh, there's going to be more of this sort of stuff required. And 
to be on the appropriate um, list and to be appropriately qualified is is important. Now, I know that many BCAs will have, if you like, local arrangements with um, perhaps engineers and others who are, are not uh, charter professional engineers, and, and I'm not suggesting that that should stop, but that perhaps there's a different form or there's a different arrangement that you can have for accepting uh, that uh, that's a sort of some sort of producer statement from uh, those people that you know and uh, respect uh, and uh, you know, for the areas of uh, that they work in. Um, so uh, it, it is a slightly difficult one. Um, and I guess, look, when if we look at Auckland, for example, like we know that they have a large um, uh, their own register and they they go through a lot of uh, checks of of practitioners and um, and so you say for, for some BCAs they they won't even accept necessarily as of right that a, that a um, the chartered professional engineer is is appropriate. So um, for but for smaller um, BCAs, um, you know, I guess we would say rely on the um, the national the, the register, um, the statutory register, which is um, administered, uh, you know, effectively by Engineering New Zealand. Um, but um, as I say, if you do have uh, uh, trusted practitioners that you know and ex and accepted uh, and and prepared to accept their work, then perhaps there's a, just another type of form that you should be considering. And some BCAs do have their own producer statements, perhaps for that purpose. Yes, and and a common question that has come up is is what about chartered members? Uh, you know, because you have a chartered member of Engineering New Zealand, uh, and chartered members, technologists, and so on. And it's important for BCAs to be aware that. Uh, you know, typically these engineers will be handing in uh, work that is around residential. There are not very many of them, excuse me, at the moment. <laughs> uh, there are not very many of them at the moment who are uh, who are doing that. But when uh, as a chartered professional engineer, you are automatically deemed to be a licensed building practitioner. And it is very important for the BCAs to be aware that if you are accepting work from a, a chartered engineering technologist or a chartered uh, member of Engineering New Zealand, they are not automatically deemed to comply. And so if they're doing residential work, then they need to be covered off by a, a licensed building practitioner. Uh, and exactly as Adam said, you know, the this is moving more and more towards uh, the licensing. Um, uh, you know, government is moving more and more towards the licensing. And so where there are, uh, you know, chartered engineering technologists and so on, then we will be encouraging those people to become, uh, you know, to, to do the knowledge assessment and become CPENG. Fantastic. Thank you. Quick question, Martin. When will these be available for, to BCAs and when do we expect engineers to be using them? Uh, well, they are. So there's there's a two week um, consultation period. We are and, and really it just depends on how much uh, feedback that we get. So the documentation will be live immediately for uh, for engineers to be using. They don't have it yet. I'm doing. We're doing uh, a different uh, version of this presentation for engineers tomorrow. And from that time, then they will have access to be able to start using the documentation. Whether you uh, accept the new producer statements immediately or not is entirely up to you. Uh, I think that's probably a fair a fair statement. Would you agree with that, Hello, um, Helen and Adam. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so whether you uh, accept the new producer statements immediately is is entirely up to you. Uh, otherwise, yeah. At, at, as of you know this time tomorrow, uh, engineers will be able to start using it. And so I would expect that it will start. To, uh, to, you'll be starting to see them just about straight away. Thank you, Martin. Now I'm aware of. So, so just a follow, quick follow up yeah. to that, Martin. So BCAs will be able to see the new versions or get copies of them so that they can check that what's coming in uh, when they start coming in uh, do match the um, what's been issued. That, 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 that'll be on the website available to BCAs uh, immediately effect, in effect. Just about. Yep. Uh, what I'll do is I will. I'll just stamp draft on them and uh, and send them out once again with this with this webinar. Great. Thanks. I'm just I'm just cognizant that we've had 11 and people will be having to leave. So just um, first to say thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope that you found it a useful conversation and given you a good overview of the um, changes around producer statements.
um, and, the, and the quality work too that, um, that Martin has been leading as well with the documentation. We've got a few links to send out to you. So we'll, we'll bundle those into one so you get one nice email. You will have a link to a survey which you can provide us um, specific feedback on. Um, in addition, we have noted all the questions here as, as well and we'll pull out themes and, and share them back where we can. So there's a, a link to the survey. Um, Martin has committed to sending um, a link to some of the information on the Engineering New Zealand website around the best practice documentation um, relating to, um, to construction monitoring and B2, so those pieces as well. And we'll send you a link to where you can access these documents. Uh, and I think that that's all. Um, if I've missed anything, type it quickly in the chat and we'll make sure that it comes out in the, um, in the, the summary um, email back to you after this webinar. Uh, so um, thank you again. Um, I think that's that's us today. Unless there's any final comments from Martin or Adam. Oh, just to say thank you very much to uh, to Adam and Helen for your help with us. Yeah, that's fine. Cheers all. Thank, thank you. you.